This is a production of Cornell University. As we've been saying, uh, welcome everybody. This is episode 19 of the Cornell Turf Show. The spring fastest 30 minutes in turf. Again, I don't know if, if this is really faster than any other 30 minutes, but uh, we like to think so. Uh, our guest today, Dr. Grady Miller from NC State University. Uh, we're gonna talk about mowers today, uh, clippings. Uh, we'll, it'll be interesting. We'll talk about mulching mowers and, and uh, side ejection, all that sort of stuff. So uh, stay tuned for that. But as always, Frank, uh, Frank will start us off with uh, some interesting tidbits for the week for our video audience and maybe a weather review as well. Well, Grady, here's a natural mower, right? Cage up the rabbit, feed them, walk them oh. around the yard. And that's one way to go. So welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, really appreciate all of you joining us live. Those of you watching the video, listening on the podcast, uh, this should be a good uh, discussion about something that, in my opinion, just doesn't get discussed enough. And oddly enough, is one of the most common things we do. I had to give a shout out to Dr. Jesse Benelli, who has a Twitter account for his front lawn. Uh, you have to admire the passion of turf people to do this and, and setting up a little golf course there. But in honor of talking about mowing, you know, Dr. Benelli may need to do some uh, sharpening of that mower blade. So, so we'll get back to mowing in a second. Just a, a news update. We gave the uh, golf guys this yesterday. Talk about a little bit today. It's, it wouldn't be springtime for most of us in, in the Northeast if we weren't talking about weeds. And all the people who study this for a living once a year are surveyed for the most common and most troublesome, right? Common is what you see. Troublesome is... Uh, how hard they are to control. And, and the survey says uh, in our field of, of turf and pasture stuff, uh, the most common or probably no surprise to you. And then you see in the most troublesome, the dandelion, the white clover drop off and pass ballum and ground ivy uh, join, join the fray. But, but crabgrass, nut sedge, uh, annual bluegrass, uh, continue to persist as most troublesome weeds. So that obviously creates enormous challenges. And I think I said, we, we had uh, Matt Elmore on the show a couple of weeks ago, and Matt was talking about how many of these troublesome weeds, particularly in the nutsedge, bluegrass area, uh, paspalum area as well, they're starting to evade our, our pre-emergent crabgrass strategy that we've had in place now for, for the better part of 40 years. We're starting to see the potential impact of climate on this, but for sure the weed spectrum is starting to get a little bit more complicated. So crabgrass germination plugs along. Uh, most of you should see active germination in the New York metropolitan area and, and into Jersey and central PA where the elevations aren't impacting. Uh, down in, in North Carolina, we're well past the crabgrass is probably making up some lawns down there at this stage of the game. And the forsythia is now with the warm temperatures coming, will really start to turn and you'll start to see this happen uh, in upstate New York. So the phenological indicators this year, uh, I would say they're a good benchmark. The prediction models also generally good benchmarks. Uh, but in general, I think neither one of these were, were as, as, as exacting as maybe we would think they would be. Uh, and they're good just times to get a, you know, give us an opportunity to look for these things like a good IPM program would suggest. Um, lawns that are looking like this, you know, I hate seeing them like this sort of indicates there was grass there at one point. Uh, they just don't seem to be progressing as well. Uh, and, and, you know, this is an indication of just maybe the wrong grass, maybe a bad soil. Uh, you wonder if you sprayed it out, uh, would the grass come back with a little bit of tender, loving care? You know, obviously a lot of lawn and grounds people get in there and aerate and do all this other stuff. And if certainly if there's a soil issue, you might do that. But in general, a lot of times a, a, a timely herbicide application, and of course the best time to do it is of course in the fall uh, and then maybe some water and, and uh, fertilizer at this time, because really it's an ideal time for, for growing grass. Now, as we mentioned, uh, if you're doing springtime weed control, this is the maps for the end of next week, right? This is basically our predictions for broadleaf uh, dandelion control, particularly with 2,4-D based on a growing degree day model developed in the Midwest and validated in some places. And again, this certainly isn't the ideal time for perennial broadleaf weed control. Uh, but if you're going to do it, 
and you're using either of these formulations, the models on the forecast website provide excellent uh, targeted times for when these things will work. Now, a lot of people, a lot of homeowners, uh, even commercial people in the spread it and forget it world, you know, where you put fertilizer, weed control and, and insecticides all in the same thing. You know, sometimes that makes sense, but a lot of times the timing for those things are not ideal. Uh, so I just remind you again, you know, these are not always the best strategies, especially in a professional environment where you have the opportunity to provide a little bit more uh, precise care in taking care of things. Now, uh, another news item, NOAA, NOAA's come out with a uh, uh, update of their normal uh, temperature conditions. Uh, every 10 years, they get reevaluated. They've just been done again recently. And uh, a slide was made by Climate Central here that uh, was looking at 30 year periods in the beginning and end of the previous century and the end of the last century and the beginning of this century. And you can see no matter how you look at the data, except for a couple of very interesting states here, Gulf Coast states that are a couple of outliers relative to being cool, but the rest of us uh, throughout the country have seen normal getting warmer. So when we say, you know, compared to normal, as I'll do in a second, you know, what, what does that mean, Frank? What is normal? Well, normal is that 30 year average. Well, as that 30 year average gets warmer, being warmer than normal is even warmer than you'd think it is. And cooler than normal is maybe like, well, what it felt like 30 years ago or 40 years ago. So we're obviously seeing a big shift in these kinds of uh, weather conditions moving forward. Now, you know, what does that mean? For uh, growing seasons, I think it's always very interesting to look at these things. You look at the length of the growing season, we expect to see, uh, you know, how it's changed from 1895 to 2015. And you see we're probably about 10 days uh, longer, but you look at other parts of the country, uh, particularly out west, where we're continuing to see warm, dry conditions really, really lengthening of the growing seasons out there. So how's it been so far this year? Well, no surprise, it's been warm. Uh, and that has been indicated in the phenology index that indicates flowering plants, spring leaf index in this case. And you can see while we're doing pretty well, uh, my colleague down in North Carolina has been a little bit uh, on the cooler side of normal. I think uh, that cool weather's gone through and, and stuck around there for a little bit. Now for us, the past week was actually quite well below normal. Uh, across the board, the only normal conditions we had were up along the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. Every place else was cooler than normal out in the Buffalo area as much as 12 to 14 degrees cooler than normal. And you can see there's been a big shift in soil temperatures where the majority of the soils throughout the Northeast last week were almost well into the 50s, low 60s. Now you can see within a week of cooler temperatures, a little bit of rainfall, temperature starting to cool off. But obviously on the whole, we continue to see conditions warm. So again, we're still at maybe a little bit behind, but you can see Buffalo remains quite a bit ahead of normal. And it looks like temperatures for the coming week are going to continue to be uh, above normal, looking at the, the projections from NOAA moving forward. Same with rainfall, except the opposite. We've had a little bit of rainfall the last couple of weeks that's helped uh, combat some of the dry weather. As you remember, we had a pretty dry winter and now uh, we started out a little bit wet and it's not looking good for rainfall moving forward. We're starting to get into this pattern of below normal rainfall for the next week, which might be welcome for many, certainly for us here at the Cornell Golf Course. But when you look at temperatures, this is the outlook made back in April for the months heading into July. And they're looking like a strong probability of very warm conditions, warmer than normal for most of us in the Northeast. Now, all that said, let's move towards the topic of today, which is mowing and growth. Uh, and I'm gonna set this up a little bit by you know, reiterating some of the data that we use to determine this. And of course, in the golf world, we're doing a lot of clipping volume collection and, and targeting nutrition around those conditions. In general, we think about it with regard to growth potential. So how much could the plants 
uh, possibly grow based on their photosynthetic activity at that time. Very simple way of looking. Well, you know, the growing season starts when we get to about 50% um, uh, growth potential when the temperatures are certainly in the mid 50s, low 60s. And you can see now with the expected weather we're going to be getting in the next few weeks, we're going to be at full throttle. These plants are not going to be inhibited from growing unless, of course, water becomes limiting. Now, Larry Stoll and Wendy at Pace uh, Turf continue to do excellent jobs in visualizing this. Uh, up in the top left is the green is the high 100% growth potential. And you can see May has been there, uh, particularly down in North Carolina uh, for, for uh, the month of May, really looking good. But uh, that's for cool season grasses, right? Yeah. Now, for, <laughs> right, for cool season grasses in June, uh, you see that, uh, and again, increased growth potential. We're going to see ideal growth potential through much of the Northeast in the coming weeks, which leads to this kind of a situation where we've got excess clippings. We talked about this last week or two weeks ago with Sean Kister from Longwood Gardens. We want to keep these clippings like fertilizers off the street in the springtime, keep these streets clean, maximizing the green filter, minimizing the gray funnel, uh, and now we get to the question for today, right? Because getting that done uh, requires the proper equipment. Now, professional turf managers are going to have a variety of options, both in zero turn, uh, mulching, side discharge. And, and so a survey was done uh, not long ago looking at, uh, you know, what kind of mowers do lawn care professionals uh, use or how do they handle their grass clippings? And you know, I was pleased to see in general, at least in this survey, very few of them in this survey were bagging them. That's a good sign. But there is, a, of course, a preponderance of mulch mowing compared to side discharge. So bring, bring on Grady Miller uh, with this particular uh, study that he did a few years ago. And it really, uh, to me, of course, it caught my interest because we've done some a mower evaluation work with consumer reports over the years. And I've had some personal interaction with Pete Sawchuk, the engineer uh, for consumer reports, who's done some of these studies, but essentially, you know, Grady, the question that I want to, you know, come up with here and what you studied is we get this, um, we get this constant conversation about mulch mowing versus side discharge, right? So let's start there. First off, why did you do that study? <laughs> it's like, we don't get enough research in this area. So I'm a little bit curious about what was your motivation and then, you know, take us through what you found, what you learned, and then I'll poke around a couple of questions. After. Yeah. Yeah. So there is a story there. So let me go back and, and, and talk through the story. Uh, right. I had a particular manufacturer contact me and said, Hey, you know, we, we want some information on, on uh, clippings and mowers and how they handle and et cetera. Will you do a literature review for us? So sure, you know, that, that shouldn't take very long, you know. <laughs> so I get in the literature and lo and behold, there's almost nothing written. Nothing. I mean, there's nothing. It's a nothing. huge boy. There's a couple of engineering type uh, articles and, and different things. So I go back to them and say, well, you, you need to get some of your, your fellow manufacturers together and let's do something. And uh, so they did. They got a couple of manufacturers together and, and I wrote a proposal up to them and, and they kind of added some things to it, et cetera, et cetera. And then when we got down to starting the study, as it got closer, they kind of lawyered up on me. So... They made the university sign, you know, pages after pages of agreements that you can't release this information because you're going to use a lot of mowers out there that we may not want this to get out. And I came back to him. I said, and that's exactly why I can't find anything in the literature. That's exactly right. You're your own worst enemy. You want data, but you won't let me release the data <laughs> once we find it. So that's kind of how we started. So in right. 2014, uh we were figuring out just techniques to use and different things so we, we tested 12 mowers and then in 2015 we tested 30 mowers and then in 2016 we looked at uh, 18 zero turn mowers so we started out with lawn tractors and then went to zero turns and we to speed up the process we were actually one year we tested in three different states 
we, we, we transported 30 mowers to Florida. A few months later, we had 30 mowers in North Carolina. And a few weeks later, we had 30 mowers in Wisconsin. So we, we did studies in three states one year, which was pretty interesting to get oh. two semi-tractor trailer loads full of mowers and haul them yeah. around the country. And, you know, it is interesting because we ran into the same thing when it came to the real mower research we did a number of years ago where we were comparing different heads and different styles. And boy, we had a lot of resistance to letting some of that information out. We had to sign a lot of NDAs if we were going to yeah. do any of this exploratory work. So, so that's the first part. The second part that's interesting here is you know, what you looked at, why you decided to look at the things you looked at. Like, you know, for example, you went in with the assumption that, well, mulch mowers cut the grass better, push it into the canopy, and that's why it's why everybody mulch mows. And yet when you got into the details of this, it sort of refuted that a little bit. But I don't know that it didn't look any better. So why did you decide to approach it in, in the way you did? Or was that something that... You, the, the funders said, hey, we want you to look at mulch mowing versus side discharge. Yeah, well, the, the, the funders in those three studies I just mentioned, uh, we were looking at, you know, mulch, side discharge, and bagging. You know, the okay. same mower set up, you know, three different ways, you know, the homeowner versions of mowers. And to be quite honest, through the course of those two or three years and all these studies we were doing, we were noticing trends and it got down to the point of like, we got to get this information out. So the, the, the study you flashed up there a few minutes ago was not supported by those groups. Ah. So I went to our, our turf center and wrote a, a quick little proposal and said, you know, this is what we want to do. We're going to get our own mowers together and we're going to self-fund it, so to speak, within our own funding mechanism so I can publish it. So that article that, that you see published wasn't funded as part of those original trials. That was our own work because I'd be damned, I'm going to get this information out there you know, somehow. Isn't that um, interesting? So that design of that study was building upon our experiences of all these other lawn tractors and, and zero turn mowers and what we had seen, but trying to really dial in a few things to, to get it out in the literature and okay. published. So right. we had noticed that mulch mowers we're not performing very good. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to say, well, what's, what's the issue there? Is it clipping size or, you know, you know, what is it? So that, that was the impetus of that study, which we did publish and, and, and get that literature out. And, okay. and I know a lot of people have come back to that study. Okay. So let me, let me, let me poke, let me poke at you for maybe the stuff that didn't get published. <laughs> what did you see when you rode the mulch mower over the ground that, led you that, that that said that doesn't look good was it clippings was it it didn't cut at all uh were you trying excessive things like consumer reports does take annual ryegrass down you know three inches in one cut what was the patterns or trends you started to see with mulch mowers that caught your attention immediately I uh, just an excess clippings on the surface I mean we we measured I don't I had some of my reports up here on my computer. We measured about 20 different things yeah. uh, when we were evaluating the turf. But, you know, did it windrow? Did there was a lot of clippings underneath, clippings along the edge? And we weighed everything. So we actually had numbers of weights on all those clippings. And then we do visual assessments of what it looked like the day after. You know, so we were mowing these areas. We did most all this work on sod farms that were very uniformly mowed. Um, and then you know come back and, and, and measure it the next day. That's when you can really see the clippings as they start to dry. And you uh, need a lot of grass to do this. You need a lot of grass. You need acres and acres of grass to do no that. No kidding. So you, you did all see. this work on sod farms. Yes. Were yeah. there some grant when you did north and south? And I, I want to refer to the study you published. You had tall fescue and zoysia grass. Correct. Um, can you can you speak for a second to the role that the kind of grass you cut, how the mower interacts with it? Are there some blades that, you know, this mulch mower was better on zoysia because it's stiffer and not as good on tall fescue because it's more flaccid? Uh, did you see anything that was really telling about the species? Because for the people that won't read the paper. Yes, those grasses that are more succulent 
and kind of sticky and clumpy when you're mowing them definitely performed worse across the board, but even worse with some of the mulching mowers. Uh, but certainly, you know, moisture conditions do and things like that on the ground can impact that as well. But, but ryegrass, you know how sticky ryegrass can be, you know, that's tough on a mower, you know, to mow and handle and, and get rid of those clippings. And it will tend to clump up inside of those mulching mowers even worse uh, than something like a zoysia, which typically is fairly dry you know, as a, as a leaf blade and it's more rigid, even the density is a little bit, you know, greater. So there's a lot of different factors with the grass. Absolutely. Okay. So I'm going to ask you to speculate, speculate a little bit uh, <clears throat> with regard to mowers that maybe you didn't study. And a lot of professional grounds, people, lawn care, people have rear discharge. And, you know, you obviously learned some things about clipping length and width um, how far it goes near the edge, where it is in the deck. For any of you that want to geek out on this, go get Grady's paper that now you know the story of getting it published. Makes it even seem more heroic. I think we talked one time, you said you were out there vacuuming. Uh, <laughs> we pre-vacuumed and post-vacuumed our areas for this study we published. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you developed the method, you got the mowers. What would you tell a professional grounds person? Does deck design matter? Should they just get the biggest horsepower and the biggest deck that they can get for it to be the cleanest cut? Is that always the way it goes? Uh, you you leave a few things in there, actually. Yeah. First off, let me mention that rear deck discharge. Um, and I'm only saying this because I have a rear deck discharge at my house, and those do not do a good job of distributing clippings. Okay. You know, the side discharge, it's a little bit shorter distance to get it away from the deck. And there's something about that throwing action that tends to, I think, give you a better quality of dispersion than shooting it out the back. That's been didn't my own paint, Didn't you paint a whole big fat red strip of paint to then do digital imagery to assess yeah. the clipping dispersal on the ground? Yeah, we did that as well. Yeah, painted the grass red so we could see it over green and then take digital images. So yep. we tried a lot of different things. It's actually pretty fun. Yeah. Um, so yeah. We're okay, so, so, no, so, so rear discharge tend to be popular, right? Because of safety issues in, in, in professional grounds, yeah. especially on operations. But it's interesting. You wouldn't necessarily tell someone if a mulch mower costs more, get a side discharge. Uh, well, I mean, there, there's reasons for using different mowers. So selection process safety is certainly part of that equation. Uh, but if you're if you're putting mowing quality at the top, that's a number one. Side discharge on average performs much better than mulching or rear discharge. I mean, and horsepower and the, and the bigger the engine, the better the cut. Uh for the most part, yes, but I mean, horsepower is not everything. Okay. I mean, what 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 is your blade length and how many blades are you spinning with that horsepower? I mean, you have three blades with 15 horsepower and, and two blades with 12, you know, something like that. So you may actually be spinning them a little bit differently than on how many spindles you're turning with that horsepower. So all things aren't equal, but certainly horsepower and and uh, blade spinning speeds and things like that, RPMs, uh, does play a role in cut quality. And we saw that. I mean, some of the undersized mowers, we saw a few mowers with some manufacturers had basically the same mower with different horsepower engines in it. And all things being the same, the same deck on a larger horsepower engine, yes, it performed better. It would move the clippings out quicker or maybe chop them up a little bit more. But Certainly, horsepower plays a big role. Um, and, and, and case in point, the study that we published, that commercial walk behind mower, uh, which I don't remember the exact horsepower, I don't have it in front of me, actually handled clipping a little bit better than the commercial zero turn right on type of mower. Okay, so this gets to a question. I wonder if it is, now I'm sure you, you sort of normalize for this, but more and more you see mower manufacturers touting how fast you can go, how efficient these things are. What is your, if you had to speculate, 
I got to think the faster you go, the worse this is. Have you found any that you felt you could go fast and still get good cut? Uh, there's no doubt zero turns, in, in that, which are throughout the industry now versus the old lawn tractor types that you know still a lot of homeowners use. Those have been uh, designed to mow quicker, efficiently, and still give you a decent quality of cut. And I, I can tell you from another experience, when I go to high schools and they're using zero turns in you know, the athletic fields and they're complaining about their cut quality, the first thing I tell them is slow that thing down and you're going to see the cut quality go up <laughs> because right. they're mowing too fast. So, so you can certainly use that against yourself too. So mowing speed does play a role, but there's no doubt that deck design as you move from manufacturer to manufacturer plays a role in cut okay. quality. All right. Now so listen. Okay. So, all right. So listen. Before we get to other questions, I got one more, and then Carl will open it up, and and certainly if you have any commentary. But one of the studies that is out there, done many years ago by our retired colleague Bob Sherman at Nebraska, is the value of a sharp blade, right? And I wonder what your thoughts. So I'm assuming. The blades were ideal every time you did these studies, right? To make sure that, yes. that, you know, that wasn't a factor, but that's not the real world as you and I know from being academics for the better part of 30 years. So what are your thoughts about how big of an impact a sharp blade is knowing what you saw with really sharp blades every time? Uh, I think sharp blades are important. They're maybe not as you know, at the top of importance, uh, because, you know, you're spinning that piece of metal so quickly. You know, I used to tell people, if you could, you know, swing a baseball bat hard enough, you could chop a tree down. You know, you have enough speed, enough momentum, that, that blade, whether it's dull or not, will make some difference, and certainly cut quality, it will help, but it's not going to make a huge difference whether it cuts the grass or not. So, yeah, I think blades are important. Uh, deck designs are important. And go back to an earlier comment, a lot of our mulch mower decks were designed to be side discharge and they're retrofitted to be mulch decks. And I think that's a downside in the, in the industry. I think they've realized that they may have to redesign some decks if they want to be just mulching decks. Okay. So uh, that's interesting because I think um, when we've done the work with Pete Sawchuck in Consumer Reports, he's had consistent uh, success with the Honda uh, hand mower, walk behind mower in the in the consumer world anyway, and and he talks about how the deck design is designed for a mulch mower, right. and that is true. Is do you see that? Did you test ones that were clearly designed for mulch mowers, or were all the ones you tested? Well, they were because it was the same mower for all three things, so they were just adapted. Do we do we have a lot of dedicated mulchers out there, and maybe they that's something they should be doing. I think we're seeing more of them out there, particularly the smaller mowers uh, that are that are just being geared towards, you know, mulching. Uh, and, and some manufacturers have figured out we may need to bolt on some other attachments to a deck to really kind of refine it a little bit more. So they, they, they're figuring it out, but they also know that they don't know that when that mower is sold, is it going to be used as a side discharge or a mulch deck? So they're they like flexibility to built in as well. So I'm not sure where that will shake out ultimately, but still, you know, we, we saw side discharge being the best in quality, getting the clippings away from the blade, getting them out pretty quickly distributed will give you better cut quality. That may not be the safest thing to do. It, it, environmentally, you may be throwing it into the street. You don't want to. So there's other factors involved, but certainly side discharge is still the probably the most efficient way of dealing with the mower clipping continuum there. Perfect. Perfect. You know, consider. Perfect. All right, Carl, that's a great place to see if there's questions. Yeah, I think we answered Vitas' question. Vitas was asking about blade designs, and I think that speaks to some of the data stuff and, and and blade speed we were talking about but uh i think my final question grady would be electric mowers are seeing more battery powered mowers out there have you screwed around with anything uh, of that nature and how does that align with stuff you've seen from these kind of traditional gas powered mowers uh yes and no we did some early work with some autonomous mowers those that are battery charged at a docking station and then go out and mow for a few hours mm -hmm. and come back we did some early testing for some companies of those and you know, th those are great, but sometimes your grass grows a little faster than they can handle it. 
and it actually it's kind of picking the mower up and they're not very heavy because of battery life. So you may have to go in there with a, a non you know, regular mower to, to bring it back down. So there are challenges with those. Uh, but now, as you mentioned, the battery powered and, it, you know, Ryobi still has a, has a ride on zero turn battery powered mower now. I've just seen those this year uh, more and more. I have not messed with those. I mean, there's, there's no reason to suspect that they won't do a good job mowing turf. And I know some of the neighborhoods near where I live now, the newer neighborhoods, the people don't like to store gasoline. So it's an opportunity for them to have a mower and not store uh, fuel. Um, but I mean, I, it's like the electric cars. I think it's inevitable these are going to certainly start catching on more and more. But I, I have not played around with it. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.